The United States is currently experiencing a political turmoil the likes of which we have never seen. I have been doing my part in signing petitions and donating to whatever causes I can. The best way that I can see to use my platform is to start something that I've been meaning to start for a while and do video essays. The first one being about ways in which the Marvel Cinematic Universe has discussed the recent issues regarding black populations in the United States and the world. So, enjoy this video essay. I will be using as little video of myself as actually possible so that I can better focus on the black people being portrayed in the movies and use clips from the movies and television series as I discuss this. At the moment, my account is not monetized for YouTube, so by watching it, you are not giving me any money, so I am by no means profiting from this issue. In the event that my account does get monetized, and I start generating ad revenue from this video, that ad revenue that I generate from this video will be going to Black Lives Matter or other important causes that deal with this issue. While I won't spend too much time on this first television series ever in the MCU, it is worth noting that Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., while having a diverse cast without focusing specifically on black characters, does have a very interesting metaphor on racism that persists throughout a lot of the series. That is, of course, the issue of Inhumans. Inhumans are people with Cree DNA in their blood that, through a process called pterogenesis, when exposed to pterogen crystals, develop special abilities based on their DNA. Several Inhumans are shown throughout the series, including Chloe Bennett's Daisy Johnson and Elena Yo-Yo Rodriguez, played by Natalia Cordova Buckley. When people such as Yo-Yo get attacked, it's specifically because of their Inhuman DNA, something that they didn't even know they had, something that they were unable to control. This is a very clear racism metaphor, even established more clearly throughout the series as a group called the Watchdogs get formed, an anti-inhuman group that lead violent attacks against inhumans. There are plenty of stories that show how clear of a metaphor it is for racism, but I'm not going to get into them now as I want to focus specifically on stories with, by, and about black people. Moving on to where it's not just a metaphor, but the issue is directly talk about, we get to see the show Cloak and Dagger. This show, among other things, follows Tyrone Johnson, played by Aubrey Joseph, as he tries to get revenge on James Connors, played by J.D. Evermore, a cop who nine years ago shot his brother, Billy, played by Marcus Clay, for racist reasons for a crime that he couldn't prove that Billy had committed since Billy hadn't committed it. In Season 1, Episode 4, Call Response, Ty and Tandy Bowen, played by Olivia Holt, finally meet up together to seriously talk about their shared pasts and stories. Ty mentions that the reason he can't just walk into the New Orleans Police Department and ask for the case about his brother to be reopened is that he is a black man living in the American South, and they will assume that he is a thug and treat him poorly. This clearly shows the issue of police brutality against black Americans and the fear that's being created amongst black people. The issue of Ty not even being able to go into a police station without automatically being assumed to be a thug shows the problem with American cops and the problem of racism in society. Tandy advises Ty to, instead of being a thug, act as a victim, so Ty steals his own bike, quote-unquote, in order to have a pretense for going into the police station. However, as soon as he enters the station, he notices that all of the cops in the room are white, and he becomes overwhelmed and leave, showing that even as the cops don't assume that he's a thug, he still gets overwhelmed just by being in the police station with a bunch of white cops. We eventually learn that Connors wasn't working alone and that his uncle, Asa Henderson, a major political figure in New Orleans, had set it up so that Connors would get away with the act, and they eventually solve the crime, but they don't exactly solve the issue overall. The show doesn't focus on solving the systemic problem of racism, rather focuses on smaller time issues following the show's pattern. As we watch Henderson get arrested and Connors get killed, we understand that we're not solving the problem, but we're getting revenge for this one person, Billy Johnson. Ty and Tandy eventually turn the conversation to Tandy's suicidal thoughts. 
Ty gets really upset at Tandy for having these thoughts, and this is the conversation that ensues. I think about it a lot. What the hell is wrong with you? You have a life and, and opportunities, and you want to waste it by killing yourself? No, I didn't say I wanted to kill myself. No, I heard I just... what you said. Look, your life isn't that bad, okay? Where do you live, Tyrone? Good house, good neighbors, you go to a good school. You don't know me. I'm sorry that your two living parents care about you so much. Must be a real drag sway. Well, you gonna teach me how to lie? You gonna teach me how to be a con man? Let me check your privilege. My privilege? I was just dropped off by a cop who told me that I can't press charges against a guy who almost... I've had a lot of things taken from me. And everything I have, I've had to steal because... Because you can. You can walk into any room in this world and never be questioned. Try walking into a department store looking like me. That's not fair because I don't the think... The world does! This conversation shows clear understanding on the MCU's part of the delicacies of the issues surrounding white privilege. Tandy is still allowed to have problems as white people are in the real world. However, that does not affect her privilege. Tandy complains about having to steal to live, and Ty points out that she gets that privilege. She gets the ability to not have people question her when she walks into a store. Ty, on the other hand, does not receive this privilege. If he were to walk into the same store, he would automatically be assumed to be attempting to rob the place. This shows the delicate issue, and it's not until the two understand that each other have problems, and that Tandy's privilege allows her problems to be different, from ties, that they are allowed to understand each other and become friends. Yet, Tandy still manages to stay out of the way of Ty's story, allowing Ty, a black American, to tell his own story of racism in America without Tandy's whiteness interfering. Ty is later accused of killing a cop played by Lane Miller named Kenneth Fuchs, whereas it was really Connors who ordered the hit. This, once again, shows the issue of black people facing cops and the rocky relationship that the two have always had. Ty gets involved in trying to stop gang violence and comes across Solomon, played by Joshua J. Williams. Solomon is uneducated and therefore unable to read, serving as amazing commentary on the educational status of black people in America. Since 1965, the United States has shown very little improvement over the education gap between white and black students, source listed below. This has been a big problem, and it's shown through Solomon as he turns to gang violence partly because he doesn't believe in schools. This education gap has made him think that the school system was going to fail him no matter what, so he turns to living with the gangs, and he enjoys his life, but still, he can't read about his hero, Luke Cage. Solomon is also a sympathetic character, which is very important in order for the message to be properly gotten across. We don't look down on him because he's not educated. We don't look down on him because of his involvement in the so-called money hustle gang. We admire him for his strong morals and the sympathetic nature of his character. Therefore, we're able to see the problem rather than seeing Solomon himself as a problematic person. This shows the continuing awareness that Cloak and Dagger has of the problems with racism in America, with the educational gap, and the relationship between black people and cops. However, Cloak and Dagger is merely aware, and they provide commentary on the fact that the problem exists. This does not necessarily propose a solution, and Cloak and Dagger really focuses on the personal effects of it. It focuses on the one case. It doesn't focus on the larger systemic problems, and therefore doesn't really propose any solutions. You have to turn to other MCU media for that, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Next up, taking a look at Luke Cage. When Jessica Jones was released in 2015, starring the character Luke Cage, played by Mike Coulter, everyone was so excited for the series Luke Cage to happen. Jessica Jones had already established Luke as a wonderful character, so having him in his own black-led, black-made series was very exciting. 
Luke Cage follows Luke as he returns to Harlem and fights local gang leader Cottonmouth, played by Mahershala Ali, getting revenge on Cottonmouth for the murder of his mentor, Pop, played by Frankie Faison. This show works very hard to debunk the stereotype that black men are always associated with gangs, especially in New York. One of the big ways that they do this is through having characters who are associated in Harlem politics but not necessarily in gangs, such as D.W., played by Jeremiah Richard Kraft, who is always selling stuff from the fights, from the gang stuff, even from the Battle of New York, but never actually gets involved in any specific gang, and Bobby Fish, played by Ron Cephas Jones, who, while encouraging Luke's actions, doesn't necessarily work with any gang or with Luke personally. The other way they work to debunk this stereotype is by showing lots of gangsters and gang leaders who are not themselves black. This includes a Puerto Rican man, the main secondary antagonist, Shades, played by Theo Rossi, and other gang leaders who aren't black, such as the Chinese Hai Ching Yang, played by Henry Yuk, and the Italian Rosalie Carbone, played by Annabella Sciorra. These non-black gang members and leaders, along with black non-gang members and leaders, such as D.W. and Bobby Fish, work to prove that there are black men who are not gangsters, and not all gangsters are black men, thereby debunking this common stereotype. And then there's the case of Mariah Dillard, played by Alfre Woodard. Mariah is a politician who is advocating for a new Harlem Renaissance, a new chance for black people to express themselves creatively and musically, as well as politically, and vote for themselves and have a say in Harlem politics. These positive initiatives are why it's such a shock when Mariah eventually kills her cousin, Cottonmouth, and retakes her position in the Stokes crime family. However, even as she becomes a secondary antagonist, she's always a sympathetic character. We always feel for her struggle not to be like her terrible grandmother, or we always feel for her when she has these emotional scenes. At least that's always the goal. I always felt for her, some people might not have. But the goal was always there, so that the politician who wants to give black people the chance to express themselves however they want, is never fully seen as the bad guy, and she's never seen as the bad guy because of these goals. In season two, when she tries to go legit and end her involvement in gang business at all, she starts her Family First initiative, which is seen by the show as a very positive thing that only gets interrupted when John McIver, aka Bushmaster, played by Mustafa Shakir, tries to attack her and get revenge for something that her grandmother did to him, not Mariah herself. By keeping Mariah as a sympathetic character, we're able to ourselves be on board with her initiatives, such as the new Harlem Renaissance and Family First. This, combined with the excellent portrayal of black American culture that is way too in-depth to go into in this one video, as well as the previously mentioned debunking of stereotypes involving black men and gang activity, are part of the many reasons why Luke Cage is an excellent example of the portrayal of black Americans in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. As with anything in the MCU, it's only high profile when it's being done in the movies. Well, lucky for this essay, it, this has been done in the movies, specifically the movie Black Panther, released in 2017. This movie follows T'Challa, played by Chadwick Boseman, the prince getting crowned king of a fictional country, Wakanda, in Africa. He continues his father's legacy, trying to capture the criminal Ulysses Claw, played by Andy Serkis. However, the plot takes a quick twist when Eric Killmonger, played by Michael B. Jordan, shoots his boss, Claw, and brings him to Wakanda, revealing himself to actually be Njadaka, a prince of Wakanda who got lost when his father was killed as a spy in the United States. The plot quickly becomes a tension between Killmonger and T'Challa, as they have different beliefs on how they should deal with the issue of racism in both America and the rest of the world. Killmonger, like Malcolm X historically, believes in a violent uprising, 
He wants to arm his spies so that they can arm black populations around the world and rise up against their white oppressors. T'Challa, on the other hand, like Martin Luther King Jr. before him, believes in a peaceful way of doing it, where Wakanda only helps in discreet ways, such as a mission undertaken by Nakia, played by Lupita Nyong'o, in the beginning of the movie, in which she helps rescue prisoners without giving Wakanda any credit, and without working in a big, violent manner. However, Killmonger's philosophy of rising against people is never completely undermined by the end of the movie. After T'Challa nearly dies, he gets rescued by the Jabari tribe and undergoes a process in which he can actually talk to his dead father, T'Chaka, played by John Connie. T'Chaka tells T'Challa that it's T'Challa's job to learn from his father's mistakes and be able to be a better king because of them. T'Challa, having learned his lesson, returns to Mount Bashengo, where he fights against Killmonger for, his, for the right to be king. T'Challa eventually stabs Killmonger, and the two of them watch the sunset together while they talk about their different ideologies. T'Challa eventually agrees that Killmonger has some decent points, and there are things worth incorporating into his own political belief system. And he takes Killmonger's advice and goes out to help and do more, even opening an embassy in the United States and telling the world about the vast amount of resources they actually have, despite appearances. This allows for a more accurate and sensitive discussion regarding the delicacies of the issue with racism. This movie, being black made, shows African culture in a way so accurate I couldn't even begin to go into it. It could be an entire video, but one important thing worth pointing out is that they even take African music, including that from a relatively new genre in Africa called Gong. This kind of music being portrayed, a relatively new African style, shows the real sensitivity and desire to accurately portray African culture. With T'Challa and Killmonger, with neither side being 100% correct, they allow the delicacies to be shown and allow for a much more interesting conversation than anything prior. They also allow to present an actual solution to the problems being presented by shows like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Cloak and & Dagger, and Luke Cage. Of course, there are plenty of other MCU properties that have black characters in it. Sometimes it's part of their identity, sometimes it's part of their character or their story, such as Runaways, Jeffrey Wilder, played by Ryan Sands, and Darius Davis, played by Devon Nixon, and they are passed together as best friends in the crypts, and Jeffrey leaving that life, whereas Darius takes over his position as being in charge. Furthermore, Malcolm Ducasse, played by Eka Darville and Jessica Jones, is used as a spy for Kilgrave, played by David Tennant, so that he can spy on Jessica, played by Kristen Ritter, without ever being suspected because who would suspect a black junkie? That's not suspicious in the eyes of racist America. Other characters, however, are just are characters that happen to be black without that blackness impacting the story in some way or it being part of their own story in some way. These characters include Antoine Triplett, played by B.J. Britt, Curtis Hoyle, played by Jason R. Moore, and Brett Mahoney, played by Royce Johnson. Both kinds of people are shown as both kinds of people exist in the real world. The MCU even has a lot of black characters who hold positions of power that are completely unrelated to them being black. This includes, but is not limited to, District Attorney Blake Tower, played by Steven Ryder, Colonel James Rhodey Rhodes, played by Terrence Howard and Don Cheadle, Inhuman Royal Family member Gorgon, played by Emmy Aquaker, and two directors of S.H.I.E.L.D., Alfonso McKenzie, played by Henry Simmons, and of course, Nick Fury, played by Samuel L. Jackson. This will only be furthered in the future with stuff like Black Panther 2 and Blade coming out, as well as other projects that are upcoming and clearly intended to further diversify the MCU and be more inclusive. This is me using my platform to draw attention to black creators in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So please go watch those products, pay attention to those black creators and all the great work they're doing, and let me know what you think. Is the Marvel Cinematic Universe doing enough to address the systemic racism that plagues this country? Is there more that they can be doing? 
What black character from the comics would you like to see adapted to the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Would you like more videos in which I discuss the way that Marvel deals with societal problems? Should there be more inclusion of these characters being put into the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Let me know what you think.